this is so ironic. I am literally writing notes for the Bobby DeBarge story review or my thoughts on the movie. And I gave an example of how the best biopic I've seen in regards to a music legend and how they had so many trials and tribulations, um, but we were rooting for this person and the ending was amazing. I referenced what's love got to do with it, the Tina Turner story. And then I received an alert that she passed today. Gut it. Like, simply gut it right now. Um, you know, and the similarities between her and Bobby, and I'm going to give my tribute to her right now, but the similarities between both of them, both of them were abused. Both of them felt neglected or were neglected. Um, they didn't feel loved. Therefore, they didn't love themselves. Um, went through hell and back in their lives. However, Tina was able to turn that pain into power. She literally took everything she went through, reinvented herself, and became the queen of rock and roll. And not just the queen of rock and roll, but the queen of her life. She took control of her life. And wow, I'm I'm at a loss for words right now. I just RIP to the legend, Tina Turner. I still don't think to this day a woman has ever gotten to Tina Turner's level, but especially a black woman that was able to reach those heights and still be considered the queen of rock and roll. Bravo. Your legacy will live on. Rest in heaven, Tina Turner. You are simply the best. Hey, what's up and hello, this is the Chris Nicole giving you my views on life, love, and the world of entertainment through my eyes. And this is my review on the Bobby the Barge story. And I'm not going to really probably do a review play by play on the scenes. This, this is just going to be my thoughts on the movie. Um, I know I'm three or four years behind, but... When they first came out with the promos and the trailer for the movie, I really thought it was a joke. I was thrown off by the wigs. I was thrown off by the acting, even the small snippets. And I said at that time, thank you, but no thank you. I'll just watch Unsungs by DeBarge and Switch. And I had already read the books by Tommy DeBarge. Bunny DeBarge, and Ederlene DeBarge, also known as Mama D. So as far as I saw it, I needed every perspective through that. I did not need to see this movie. So I'm on Tubi, and I'm scrolling through Tubi to see what the app has to offer. And they actually have pretty good things on there, from TV series like, you know, Love, Crap Country, to a lot of good movies. and. Lo and behold, though, I see the Bobby DeBarge story. So I said, why the hell not? Let me see what this movie is all about since at this point it's free and I don't have to pay for it. So let's just say I wish I got my hour and 30 minutes back. And so just to give you a recap on who Bobby DeBarge is. For those who may not know, and that's another problem that I have with this actual movie is that they almost made the movie as if everyone knows who Bobby DeBarge is. Bobby DeBarge is not a Michael Jackson. Bobby DeBarge is not a Whitney Houston. For the most part, those names that I just mentioned, their legacy and their years in the business were consistent 
And we literally saw a, sometimes their personal lives play out in front of our eyes. A lot of us know their story. But Bobby DeBarge's life ended very abruptly. And his career also ended the same way. So they definitely should have made a better movie to, for people to get a sense of who Bobby DeBarge was in general. And I definitely don't think that they did that. So let me just give you a backstory on Bobby DeBarge. Bobby DeBarge is the eldest brother of the DeBarge family. The DeBarge family was signed to Motown back in the late 70s, early 80s. And they have, for their short amount of time in the industry, as far as being successful in the industry, this family created some of the best R&B music that we will ever hear in our lifetime. But it started with Bobby and his brother Tommy DeBarge. They were in a group called Switch back in the late 70s. Um, the DeBarge family comes from, well, they started off in Detroit, Michigan, but they ended up moving to Grand Rapids, Michigan. And that's where they really developed their um, musical um, talents was in Grand Rapids. And they ended up joining a group with their childhood friend, which I believe his name is Greg Williams, Gregory Williams, and Switch was created. And because of what Bobby DeBarge was able to create with his group Switch is the reason why he was able to get his other siblings, the DeBarges, Bunny DeBarge, Elle DeBarge, Randy DeBarge, Marty DeBarge, and James DeBarge. He was able to get them a deal with Motown and they went on to create even more hits than Switch. Okay. If you just look up their catalog, even still to this day, some of your known hip hop artists, R&B artists constantly sample the DeBarge's work. Okay. But if it wasn't for Bobby and his skills, and in my opinion, Bobby DeBarge has the best falsetto ever in the game of music no one could touch his falsetto not even l and i think l knows that too bobby still, still to this day has the best falsetto i have ever heard in my life especially from a man okay um hands down the best and a great lyricist amazing writer amazing musician so he was really the head of that family in a sense of his musical abilities. A lot of them looked up to Bobby and Bobby's life was cut short and a lot of it was due to his upbringing. Um, he had a very abusive father that abused all of them. Um, and dare I say it, the mother turned a blind eye to pretty much all of it. I mean, her book, she tries to defend everything, but as far as I see it, if you really want a good reference of what they went through, my recommendation, read Tommy DeBarge's book and Bunny's book, especially Tommy's. Tommy, hands down, has the best book. He holds nothing back, and he even is willing to make sure that we know that he was aware of his issues also. He's very honest and very vulnerable. In my opinion, he has the best book. In fact, I will put down in the description, there is a lady that's on YouTube who actually reads the book um, on YouTube, Tommy's book from beginning to end, every chapter. And I think she's also reading Bunny's book right now. You can go to her page and you can listen to it. Very deep. So with that, you know, Bobby ended up developing more than most likely a lot of mental issues. Um, I'm sure at this point, a psychiatrist would have definitely probably diagnosed him with probably several things. Um, and what his father did to him, and it definitely has been alleged and has even been stated, the father physically abused him, mentally abused him, and S.A. him also. I'm sure you guys will understand what S is and in return allegedly Bobby did this to some of his siblings as well okay so he never really had a chance 
But what he did have was a musical talent that couldn't be denied. But before he could even really, before he even got into the music industry the way that he wanted to, he already had a drug problem. He had an H problem, okay? Um, but he got clean for a little while just to be able to be put back into the group, which was now known as Switch. And the short time that they were together, they were able to make amazing songs. I Call Your Name, They'll Never Be. Um, You're the One for Me is one of my favorite songs, My Friend in the Sky. Just hit after hit after hit. So with that being said, going into this movie, this movie, um, first of all, they start off the movie, two scenes back to back, start off with Bobby in the hospital, okay? Um, we haven't even had a chance to get to know him yet. We first see him sick and not being able to really talk. And then when he does talk, he's saying he's tired. And then the next thing you know, we see him on stage with his group switch. But instantly, even after that, we immediately see him high, getting high, and then being a straight, arrogant, entitled asshole when he is having a meeting with his brother Tommy, Greg, who was the founder of the group and their manager. So immediately my thoughts are, why am I rooting for him? Why am I watching this? Because already I'm turned off. And I'm thinking that whatever is going on in the hospital is a result of him being the way that he is right now. That's my first instinct. If if I don't know the story, okay, I'm aware of the Bobby DeBarge story because I watch Unsung, like I said, and I've read the books. Um, but instantly I'm like, why am I invested in watching this? He's an asshole. He's entitled. He's arrogant. He thinks he's the group. So why do I care what happens to him? That's first thing. And one thing that I have learned about really good biopics is that you really have to start off with taking us in the beginning, then bringing us to the end. And while Bobby DeBarge ending is by far not a good ending at all, it seemed like that man could not catch a break at all whatsoever. There's still certain small clips of redemption of him changing his life towards the end that we could have seen before his final demise in the movie. So, one, I don't think the writing was good, and I'm just going to be honest. The writing wasn't good. And because the writing wasn't good, in my opinion, the acting wasn't good. The acting was over the top. And a lot of times when the acting is over the top, it typically means that the actor doesn't really have much to work with because the writing isn't that good, okay? I've talked about exposition a lot on this uh, channel, a lot of exposition. And in my opinion, if you're going to do something like this where the main character is not alive to tell his story do not be cheap asses about it and do it right. And so I'm looking at the executive producer and producer list when I'm watching the show and it, I mean the movie and it's in the beginning. The only DeBarges that were a part of this was Terry DeBarge, which was Bobby's wife towards the end of his life. And from my understanding, she literally was towards the end of his life. I want to say she met him mid 80s. They had a baby. He ends up going to jail. By the time he gets out, he only lived for like maybe a year and a half, two years tops from my understanding. So her perspective really is only based on what she saw and probably what Bobby told her in that little time that he was able to talk to her, I guess, about his life. Um, now, personal backstory, I actually used to be cool with Chico DeBarge. 
I met Chico through a girl that he used to date at the time. So I understand how you may not want to get that many debarges involved because let's just say, especially if they're not in the most healthy state of mind, it can probably be very draining to deal with them. Because my experience at times, it was very draining. Um, so I get that maybe you don't want that many of them involved, but at least, at least, at the very least, use their books as a reference. Okay. At the very least, use the books. Um, at the very least, try to see if Bunny and Tommy will give their input because of course they would know Bobby's story more than any of them. Okay. Bunny's the oldest. Then it was Bobby. Then it was Tommy. Those three were the most abused by the father and they have the most, I want to say the most compelling stories because I think all of them have a story. Um, but yeah, at the very least get them. So the fact that I only saw Terry and Bobby's, uh, sons, I was like, okay, well, I can see why we don't really have that much of a backstory on his life in the beginning, because who's there to really talk about it? Um, I saw Irv Gotti on there and I was like, why the hell is he an executive producer? But I guess at the same time, he's trying to get into the movie and TV world, but damn it, this wasn't a good look. But anywho, let me move on. So with that, most of the time we just see Bobby high. We see him high. We see him erratic. We see him, you know, very bitter when it comes to his mother, which that I can see that. Because, of course, like I said, while the father did most of the abuse, the mother really didn't do anything to stop it, okay? For example, Tommy has an actual part in his book where he said his father beat him so much that he was bleeding. Like, not just small cuts, but bleeding, bleeding. And literally, the father went into the kitchen and got salt and put salt in his open wounds, okay? And the father said, don't touch him. You better not do anything. And the mother, because she was scared of him too, did not go over there to protect her child. That's just one story of, I um, um, am assuming many, but that's one that he definitely put in his book. So with that, I could see why he was upset with his mother, of course, naturally. Um, but because of that and his drug use and his bisexuality, because uh, both Tommy and Bunny talk about that. And even in Unsung, they mentioned that he said he was bisexual. Now, whether he was really bisexual or he was actually gay, but because, of course, back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, it was just like you being gay was just like literally you were a mark or you were a bullseye. Who knows? But what we do know is he definitely was bisexual. They didn't talk about that in the movie, which honestly would have been a very, very great talking point or scenes that we could have had because what was it like to be bisexual or to be gay back then? And you're this superstar that all of these women are fiending over and you're dating a Jackson. And of course, child, let me tell you something. Those debarges will not let it go that they both used to, to date Jacksons, that they both dated Jacksons. Well, hell, James married Jackson, but it's almost like they will continue to talk about that forever. It's like their claim to fame at this point, more so than their music, is that they want to talk about how Bobby used to date Latoya and how James married Janet. Thank God they ran as fast as they could. And I just hate to say it, but the reality is they they do and still have demons. Like to to deal with them means you're probably gonna go through some shit. I mean, it is it is what it is. Um, but all I saw was a man who was self-destructing, a man who was angry. But I had nothing to hold on to while I'm watching this movie. It was too fast. In my personal opinion, we probably should have started off with him as maybe a teenager or a child in Grand Rapids. This should have been maybe a part two, part three type of series versus just one movie. Um, because there were so many things that they needed to include in there for us to be able to really get what we needed to get 
especially for someone who is not alive and someone who didn't have documentaries, a lot of documentaries on him. For example, Easy E, Straight Outta Compton. Um, that was a movie we still were able to get enough, but at the same time, we had enough already because he did a lot of interviews because they were like literally the pioneers for gangster rap. So there was a lot of interviews, a lot of documentaries, even his own words that allowed us to really get a glimpse of already who he was. But at the same time, the writing was good and the damn actor who looked nothing like Easy E. And that's another thing. You don't have to have an actor that looks exactly like the actual real life person, but that actor, he or she should be able to capture the essence of that person. That's what a great actor or actress does. Angela Bassett, Tina Turner, she don't look nothing like Tina, but at the same time, we damn sure felt it was Tina on that screen. The same thing with the actor that played Easy e This actor that played Bobby, <sighs> huh? Now, apparently he's a Disney, he, he used to be an actor for Disney. I don't know how you go from Disney to doing this, but it just, it didn't hit for me. It did not hit for me. Um, yeah. Uh, then before we can even blink, we go into James and Bobby and them clearly seeing that they just don't get along. And there's small clips of them in their childhood that are so short and vague. Um, and based on what we see with the back, um, the flashback with James and Bobby is simply what it looks like to me, a big brother typically does to a little brother. When the big brother gets in trouble by the parent, they may fight, they may scuffle or whatever the case may be. And that's typical behavior. Based on what Tommy's book says and based on what James has implied but hasn't really said, it damn sure wasn't minor like that, okay? I can almost say probably educated guess what happened to Bobby to the father. He did the same thing to Tommy and he probably did it to James. My opinion, this is not factual, but it's possible because Tommy talks about certain things that happened between him and Bobby when they were kids also. So when you see this tension and James is making it seem like he hates his brother. And then we see this flashback scene of what seems to be a minor scuffle of a brother pretty much saying, you big baby, like don't tell on me. And you see that clearly he probably punched him or slapped him or whatever the case may be. Nah, you're going to have to give me more to make it believable. And another thing is, I just don't think this was a good movie for TV one. Based on these books that I've read, Bobby the Bar's story is like Precious the Movie on steroids, okay? You definitely need to make this rated R, rated uncomfortable, rated hell no. TV One couldn't do it. It's too, it's too much of a very, it's a horror movie. For like, honestly, like it is a real life horror movie. A TV one can't do this because you can't do just some of the stuff that they went through on a TV one. You're going to have to take this to premium cable. You have to, if you really want to tell the story right. Another thing is Bobby and Chico end up going to jail for drug trafficking. And we literally see that Bobby finds out, and this is, this is true based off of unsung, Bobby finds out he contracted HIV. Um, now, we don't know when he contracted it, but he finds out while he's in jail. And so literally at that point, it's a real quick scene. He tells his wife in the movie, that's a quick scene. Next thing you know, he's getting out of jail. And after that, he's just singing to her. And I don't know if that's supposed to be his spirit singing to her or he's actually in front of her 
singing to Terry like he's singing a love song to her. And then there's like clips in between that where he's coughing and pretty much um, dying in the hospital. Now, from my understanding, Bobby did have slight redemption when he found out that he had HIV. When he got out of jail, he made amends with some people, especially his former group from Switch. He actually came out, went to LA, and called his main buddy, Greg, from Switch. And clearly they didn't see eye to eye and they had their beef probably for a while because of what, how things went down. But he clearly redeemed himself and Greg apparently helped him with his last album as well as the other Switch members. Why didn't we see that? I mean, at the end of the day, his story is extremely sad, but he had some redemption qualities that would have made us appreciate this movie more. He got out, he made amends with them. You know, and he was trying to make amends with his family. Now, from my understanding, he really didn't give any apologies. And it's probably difficult for him to give an apology because how can you apologize for some of the shit that you did? I mean, you guys got to read those books or at least listen. I, like I said, I'm going to post the, the link. Listen to the books. Um, But he still redeemed himself. And apparently he stopped getting high off of drugs. And he was trying to convince his brothers and amongst other people to get their lives together. He was really trying to let them know where this could lead them before he left this earth. We should have saw that. We should have saw that. Yes, granted, he had a horrible story, but that would have made me root for him more and felt more sad that we lost this, this not just a musical legend, but this human being. I just felt like it, there's so much shit to say. It just wasn't good. It was not a good movie. It was horrible. They could have done a way better job than that. I'm sorry. And then they had, oh my gosh, they had Big Boy from Outcast as Barry Gordy. Then they had this random guy as Jermaine Jackson. And I was like, who, where did they get these people from? And then another thing, when they had the, the barges, um, on Soul Train and Don Cornelius, they had him show, you know, of course, his normal part where he talks before and he introduces his his guests. I don't know how old you guys are that are listening to this who remember Soul Train, but I remember Soul Train. And what I loved about Soul Train is that 98% of the people that looked like me were on Soul Train, whether they were singing, performing, or they were literally the dancers. Baby, that scene... <laughs> In this movie, when they showed the DeBarges on Soul Train, let's just say that was a um, very diverse, very, very diverse uh, audience that was looking on. And I said, now, this is not no damn Soul Train. And apparently they filmed this in Atlanta. Y'all couldn't even get that scene right to make it look more realistic for Soul Train. Like, this was just lazy. I don't even know if I can necessarily say it was a budget issue. It was a lazy issue. It was, let me just put some quick shit together because people are just going to still watch it issue. I mean, literally, I know people who have no budget who created better masterpieces than this shit that they put on TV one. Like, I honestly want to know what the other family members feel about it. I think Bunny spoke on it and said they did not have any input on it. I want to know how they feel about it. Because here's the thing. Unfortunately, because of their lifestyle, none of them have been able to redeem the DeBarge's name. Granted, their legacy will continue. They did enough in their lifetime as far as what they were able to create in that short amount of time, that music will live on. But who is going to carry on the name in a positive way? Because no one right now is really redeeming the name in a positive light. And this movie damn sure didn't do it. Because like, for example, we clearly know Michael Jackson's ending was devastating to all of us. And how we found out, you know, he was addicted to stuff that we weren't aware of. But that man's legacy is stamped 50 times over. 
And even with his sad ending, he is still going to go down in history as the greatest entertainer of all time. What is the barge stamp? Yes, great music. But at the end of the day, if something happened to them tomorrow, who, instead of it being a tragedy, who continues it to make it a victory? Because it's not a victory. It's not. And as of right now, I don't know if any of them have that victory to carry on that name. Because we literally just saw a couple years ago, if not that long ago, there's still drug charges on a couple of them. So, you know, when maybe the people that are in the flesh can't necessarily live up to the music they created, at least give us a damn movie that will live up to that legacy as far as their music is concerned. At least give us that. But they failed. They failed. And I'm so disgusted and disappointed in the situation. And so I didn't want to go scene by scene because honestly, to me, most of the scenes were not even necessary. Most of the scenes, like I I left watching this, this movie and saying, what was the point? Like, I, I did not stop. Like, after I stopped watching the movie, after the movie was over, I was like, I don't feel anything. I'm not crying. I'm not, you know, at least having a smile on my face saying, well, at least, you know, he gave himself to God or at least, you know, he made amends with, you know, his, his friends and he redeemed himself. None of that. We get him coming out of jail and now he's randomly singing to his wife who was honestly a short part of his life. I'm over it. I'm done. I don't know what else to say. What I do know is, is that TV One, Swirl Films, everyone who was involved in this, oh my gosh, seriously. And unfortunately, when you have, I mean, I guess you can have more than one movie but when this happens, it's almost like typically people don't want to touch another movie again about the same person. So I don't even know if somebody would come back and, you know, give Bobby DeBarge the proper movie that he deserves. I don't know. Because at this point, after this movie, I don't know if anybody would touch it after this. But with that being said, I know this is long. I hope I was able to explain my disgust and me being disappointed and giving examples in the process, but there was no scene that I appreciated. Even the scene between James and Bobby fell flat for me because again, like I said, the way that scene was supposed to be, there was a lot of hurt. There was a lot of pain. Um, but then when we see that flashback of a simple scuffle between big brother and, and little brother, I was like, really, this is what you've been upset about all of these years. No, we need, we need more deeper details. So yeah, I, 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 there was nothing here that made me say, you know, okay, well, at least like that, at least like that. I don't like any of it from the wardrobe to everything to the set. It was horrible. It was horrible. So what do you guys think about it? Please give your thoughts and your opinions. Um, and again, like I said, when I was taking my notes, I found out that Tina Turner had passed. And that's how a biopic should be done. What's Love Got to Do With It is a classic. I could still watch that movie. And I still feel the same way of wanting to stand up and grew to what's love got to do with it at the end when we see Angela Bassett and then from Angela Bassett to going into Tina Turner, actually the real Tina Turner when she's in concert. I am in tears because I am happy that she was able to find herself and find her value and her worth. I'm leaving there like, yes, Tina, yes. Like, but even if it's not a happy ending, I want to feel something. I didn't feel anything for Bobby. But what's love got to do with it, to, in my opinion, is one of the top five as far as biopics are concerned. That movie and The Jacksons and American Dream are my top two. And maybe the third one is The Temptations. The Temptations was good also. And 
every single situation and temptations wasn't a happy ending either. But they gave us a full-fledged story where at the end, we could at least say, thank you for the memories. Thank you for even with all that you went through, you gave us, you know, we you gave us classic, you know, music that we can live and, and be able to listen to forever. And at the same time, I listen to the, the, the Temptations music differently now because now I know their backstory. If it wasn't for me reading the books from the DeBarges, I wouldn't know Bobby's backstory by looking at that sorry ass movie. You know what I mean? Like, because honestly, when you really understand her, uh, understand Bobby's story, you would be like, damn, where did that talent come from? How are you able to find that power in that powerful falsetto and be able to find the words to write and make this godlike music when you were going through hell and demonic shit in your home on a day-to-day -day basis like that's where he found his safe haven was in his music you would never know listen to bobby barge that he went through all of that hell in his household and that's what i wanted to see i wanted to be able to say at the end like damn this is tragic but damn bobby like damn like you know you were able to have some type of redemption redemption and through it all you found God in the end. You found yourself in the end. Something. But we didn't get none of that. So what's your take on the Bobby DeBarge movie? I know this is long. Please give your opinion. Like I said, I'm going to give you the link to the lady who actually reads the books for Tommy and Bunny. And yeah, um, like, share, and subscribe. I'll see you on my next video. Peace.